Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today I've got something pretty neat to share with you. We've got a new inbox Macintosh MR78 uh, tuner. Um, it's an open box, meaning um, someone's been in it a few times. But the thing is absolutely brand new. It's unused. It has every little bit of or uh, every bit of kit that would have come from the factory. So I thought I'd kind of do a, an unboxing video, sort of like 2023 style, on what it would be like to buy and, and get an MR78. And then what I've lined up here on the bench, a ton of other tuners and, and receivers from Macintosh to kind of show you sort of the, the lineage. How, what was the earlier ones, good ones to, to buy, bad ones to avoid. I've got at least four here and then I've got a huge rack full of stuff over there to share with you as well. And I also have just out of the box, the brand new tuner from Macintosh, the MR89, which is pretty cool. So hang in there. Um, I'm going to jump right to it. This video should be around uh, 15, 20 minutes, and we're going to dive deep. All right, let's start by talking about the price of this thing. So 1972, it actually ran for a bunch of years, but the earlier models were 1972. This would have retailed for $16.99. That is, Elliot looked this up in the computer for us in the Department of Labor calculator. It's around $12,000, which is insane for a tuner, but it was a pretty complex tuner. It was expensive to make, not just because of the glass and the metal chassis, but it was a fairly intricate circuitry and it had a pretty expensive development process as well. So twelve grand, quite a bit of money. Uh, I think the current model from Macintosh is even a lot less than that, even though it has a billion more features. So I um, thought I'd share that with you before we jump in. All right, so in addition to being uh, $16.99, a comparable car, the average car back in 1972 would have been about $3,500. So people often talk about how expensive high fives have gotten, but it certainly was expensive back in the 70s if you wanted the really good stuff. And that's what we got here. Check this out. This is how Macintosh used to pack uh, and secure the corners. Now they use a high density foam, but um, they used to use the sort of fold it up cardboard for the corners. Um, and then this is always appreciated, a really nice diagram on how to get this thing back in the box and how to unbox it. So if you got to send it in for service, and you did back then, stuff like this needed to be serviced every decade or so. So it was pretty common to have to get this over to a clinic or back to Macintosh over time. So here are instructions on the pen locks and the feed and uh, how to get this back in there. So let's keep going. Now, how do we end up with um, an MR78 new in the box? My guess is that um, this probably changed hands a few times within collectors. It's not uncommon for uh, Macintosh collectors to find a brand new piece and just stash it away in a closet. Um, speculators, I call them, you know, you're essentially just buying a great piece of gear and then hoping it goes up in value over time and man if you bought just about anything that Macintosh made in the 70s and you saved it new in the box you would have quite a bit of a of an investment or a return on investment so this one has serial number of uh, AD 6979 and not much else on it um, I do have a receipt that came with it it's not the original receipt, but it looks like in 2005 it changed hands. It went from from a retailer to a consumer. All right, diving further in, and this is a complete kit. So we've got everything, including the mounting plate. This plate is what you would use um, to mount this into a piece of furniture or into the wall. It wasn't uncommon to have, let's say, a custom piece of furniture where you would cut in. Uh, your Macintosh gear and, and put it into the furniture, essentially just exposing the front panel. And so this is essentially a diagram that um, lets you know where to drill and cut and all that stuff. Um, I actually have a system at one of my ha at my weekend house that I took three vintage pieces, including uh, MR71, I believe, and mounted it into a into the wall. It looks super cool. MR78 manual in its original sleeve and. It would have come with a registration or service contract application. You could get a service contract on these units when you bought them back then. Um, and 
and are your friends interested in stereo? In other words, they're hunting for referrals here, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, moving on, here's the top packing. It's funny, this is a, a piece of packing that we still see even today. It's sort of double folded with, uh, with a little flap on it. And then we've got it, uh, a, a bag says, thank you for buying Macintosh. Now you will hear all there is to hear. All right, let's get it out of the box. So diving into the mounting options, here is someone uh, cutting out essentially a wall or a cabinet using the template and then utilizing uh, the screws and this sort of backing kit to attach it. Uh, and here are the pan lock trays. These can be used both inside of a cabinet or inside of you know, furniture or on the wall. So these um, allow the unit to slide in and lock into place. I'll show you that in a bit later. Uh, the manual is super cool. Um, a bit more than you, than you get nowadays. There's a really neat section on, on performance, the limits here. and uh, charts illustrating selectivity and separation and all that. So they took this stuff really serious back then and people were more willing to dive deep and get a real understanding of how things work. I don't see that nowadays. Manuals kind of keep it super simple. I guess they don't want people diving too deep or getting their hands inside the unit. So they try to keep, I'm sure for legal, legal reasons, they, they give you less information than we used to get. And then there's um, a brochure that came with it as well, the Ultimate FM Tuner. Uh, a bit later in the video, I'll talk about where this sat in the lineup and, and how to compare it to other units like those. Um, so I'm going to put away all this mounting hardware and then un unwrap this. So whenever someone buys a system from us, I always ask if they want a tuner with it. And I get a lot of surprised people. They're like, why would I want a tuner? Um, those went out in the 1980s. Um, well, I'll, we sell a ton of tuners, both new and refurbished or vintage. Um, and I still use one myself. I really enjoy it. Um, I have the privilege of living in the New York area where we have some great stations. We've got a great jazz station and a great classical station. So sometimes I just don't feel like streaming. Sometimes I just kind of want to walk up to my stereo, hit a button and have something play. Sorry about that. My phone keeps ringing. Somehow the world knows when I'm making a video. So yeah, we have really good stations here, and um, we've seen, we have some good ones in Hoboken as well here in Jersey, so there's no lack of good source material. Um, sometimes I just don't wanna use my phone. I'm kinda done at the end of the day. I wanna walk up to a piece of equipment, flip some knobs, switches, and, and get uh, some good music going. And FM tuners are great for that. And you don't need much of an antenna. Uh, we've sort of figured out what the best antenna setup is. We have this one from Magnum Dynalab that's like 150 bucks that we love, and we get great results with it. I'll put a link to that in the, down below. Um, obviously, you can get all these stations over the internet, but it's just not the same thing to me. You know, getting an analog signal over the air and decoding it with a cool piece of gear is uh, is a lot more fun. And um, Hi-Fi is also about having fun, not just listening to music. So here we are, the MR78 in absolute pristine, untouched condition. Um, we've never had anything sort of this minty before. Um, this chrome here in particular, this tends to pit even if, even if it's well cared and kept in a dry environment over time, just from the oil of the fingers and stuff, this ends up pitting as well as all these jacks. Uh, there are dissimilar metals, so there is some corrosion there typically that we don't see here. So super bright, shiny chrome. This is uh, how it would have come from the factory. The paint is even, there's no smudges or fingerprints or anything on it. I see they even use a piece of cardboard to protect the flywheel, which is here. So that's pretty neat. So the flywheel kind of uh, is what gives it some momentum as you turn the needle. It allows it to kind of have some heft and weight to it, which feels good. Um, the glass is obviously intact. Um, it's nice to see one this clean.
Now, I don't think I've ever had a piece of new old stock Macintosh in the shop. We've done a bunch of videos before on Morantz. Uh, I think we had an 8B and a 7 preamp that was new old stock. Uh, I'll put some links for those as well. Um, and also a Luxman C something preamp that was also uh, managed to survive all these years without being used. Oh, and um, a Techniques uh, reel to reel. Um, all right, so with vintage equipment, especially stuff that's been off for this much time, it's important to kind of turn it on carefully. You don't just plug it into the electric and fire it up. You've got capacitors that have been dormant for decades and stuff. You've got chemicals in them and things that kind of want to come up slowly and easy. So we have these things called variacs that we use to bring them up to speed slowly without damaging stuff. And that's probably what we'll do here. Uh, hook it up to variac and power it up kindly so that we don't blow anything or, or make any damage. All right, let's take a look at the back and see what we've got. Other than the uh, captive power cord, they didn't have removable power cords back then. And this is how it would have been wrapped from the factory. That's how we know it's never been used. Uh, we have two test points here to access specific points of the, of the circuit board. I don't know if it's horizontal and vertical output. I'll ask Ben, he'll know. We've got a fuse and an outlet. Um, it's a convenience outlet in case you want to plug in another piece of equipment right there. Uh, we've got spring terminals for the antenna. Uh, we have a 300 ohm uh, antenna with a ground. Then we've got uh, a 75 ohm coax antenna. This is what we're more familiar with nowadays. And audio outputs. We've got fixed and uh, front panel controlled. So this is a fixed volume and these uh, we have volume in the front. So yeah, I got a feeling these are XY outputs essentially to hook up to you know, an analyzer or a they made an MPI-4, which would have been a cool match to this. I'll pull it off the shelves and show you what that's like. So, so I've got Ben with me. He's going to talk a bit about the, the layout and the signal flow of the MR-78. Come on, Ben. So underneath this cover is the front end. So when we're spinning this control here, there's actually a uh, set of strings that come across here and spin the actual tuning gang. So that's underneath here. After the front end, it moves to the IF chain. And a cool thing about the MR78 is it has narrow, regular, and wide uh, IF bandwidth, so you can kind of fine tune your IF to optimize it for the signal that you're trying to receive. After that, we go into the detector, which I believe is under this cover, and then back here is the MPX, so this is what decodes the stereo broadcast. And that's kind of the basics. And the power supply. Yep, power transformer for the power supply here. Um, let's see if there's anything else. We got meters on the front, so. Our overall signal strength is here, and then our center tuning is indicated here. And there's a special, I forget exactly what style lamp is in here, but it's like a long, almost neon uh, style lamp that's in the indicator, so that looks really cool when it's lit up. Okay, you want to talk a bit more about the knobs? Um, so we have the normal, narrow, and super narrow IF here, and that's going to be uh, determining how tight your um, your IF is, and the trade-off is, if you are in the, the normal mode, you get more fidelity, more frequency, but you can, you can have more interference from the sides. And then as you narrow it in, you can get tighter and tighter on the station and reject the stations around it. So it kind of just gives you flexibility for um, a station that might be a little bit weak and you're having trouble getting it to tune in without interference from adjacent stations. So that's the, the uh, what do they call it? Selectivity control here for the meter that allows you to switch between signal strength and multiplex, or sorry, multipath distortion for this meter here. So on signal strength, it's just gonna tell you how strong your station is with the needle. When you go into multipath, that's for antenna placement. So if there's a specific station you're trying to optimize for, you can go into the multipath, and then you would just rotate your antenna until the needle had the least amount of distortion. The filters, this is for, say you have a stereo station that you really wanna to listen to, but it's kind of a little bit too noisy for your taste, and you want it to, um, to sound a little bit better. You can bring in these filters, which are going to act to uh, kind of reduce that stereo noise by combining some of it down to mono. Muting, we have out, distance, and local. So if you're trying to pull in a really weak station, you might have to turn the muting off so that you can receive it. When you go into distant, you're going to get a little bit of muting. So if you tune between, instead of hearing a bunch of noise, it'll only uh, output volume when you're on a strong enough station. And then when you're in the local, that's only gonna bring in super strong stations. So this gives you some flexibility on your muting. Uh, 
mode, we can force it into stereo with stereo only. We can force it into mono, or we can let it go in auto, and it's going to flip between mono and stereo whether the pilot is present. Um, has variable output. I believe this says fixed and variable, right? Yeah. So you can either plug it into the fixed jacks if you're running it straight into a preamp, or if you wanted to balance the level of the tuner to your other sources, like maybe your turntable's a little bit quiet and your tuner's too loud, you could use the variable jacks and back this down a little bit so that your sources balance out a little bit better. And then just the tuning knob here. And for lamps, these show which mode you're in for the IF and let's hear what's this function stereo filter and muting so depending on where you have these controls you get different colored lights in this area all right thank you Ben okay this is a picture we got from the internet uh, just to show the lighting it's kind of hard to capture on the actual device because of the glass but I thought this would be a better representation up here on the left we've got the functions uh, selectivity those are all bulb lit uh, with color filters on them um, that is the uh, signal strength meter on the left and the center tuning meter right there on the right. Um, the volume is also your power button on the bottom right and then the pan locks allow you to lock it into a case uh, like all the other Mac components from that era. All right, so Here's the actual unit. Again, so you can um, kind of see it lit up. Sorry about the glare. It it's plugged in, but it's not around. lit very bright. Now, vintage stuff from Macintosh to yeah, some people's disappointment is not very bright. Not. Uh, in a dark room, it looks gorgeous, though. So, um, unlike the modern stuff that's so much brighter uh, and backlit with uh, pretty bright LEDs. Uh, sorry for all the glare. It's really difficult to photograph properly. So, um, I think next I'm going to just talk a bit about the lineup and, and sort of what is available from Macintosh. Um, so 70s so is the MR78 as we just went over. Let's go back in time into the 60s. This is the MR67. Um, it's also a highly regarded tuner. It uses all tubes, or mostly tubes, as you can see um, there in the back. This one has not been restored yet. This is a candidate awaiting restoration here at SkyFi. Um, but there are other models similar to this on, on our website if you want to see something or if you're ready to purchase something. So super early, a little bit later, MR71. Um, again, a tube uh, tuner as well. Um, there were a couple of uh, receivers as well. Now the receiver is an item that has a preamp and amp and a tuner in it. I have three sitting here that were just restored, so I thought I'd show you a Mac 1900, a uh, Mac 1700, and a Mac 1500. 1500 is a tube driven unit, so this one's super desirable and cool. Um, I'm going to keep going down the line. So, from tubes, we go into solid state. This is the MR77. So, this is essentially the little brother to the MR78. It's, um, as you can see, instead of uh, six knobs, it's got four knobs in the front, so they've given up a bunch of features, but it still has pretty good performance. It's the exact same layout and a lot of the same internals, just uh, stripped down from features. And then um, the MR80. The MR80 was their first one to have a digital display. Um, it has a conventional red digital display here and it has these sort of touch capacitive buttons on it which are kind of fickle. Um, we, we get a mixed bag when we buy the MR80s. Some of them become parts machines and others we are able to sort out. Uh, but this one's a little riskier in terms of ownership than the 78. So if you can afford an MR78, that's the one that everybody wants. You know, it's always in the top five lists of the best tuners made. And that includes things like the Marantz, uh, the Tambor 3001, the Sakaras, um, the reference Sakara tuners, and there's a few other ones in there, but 78 is at the top of most lists. I also mentioned the maximum performance indicator, the MPI-4 which was sort of like a sidekick to the MR78 or the MR77. I think I've got one kicking around in here somewhere. This is our wall of Macintosh. This is where we keep all our stuff that's ready to roll, that's been restored and gone through. Here it is, MPI-4. So this is super cool. It's got an oscilloscope on it. It's essentially just an oscilloscope in a box. So you connect this or you sit this on top of the MR78 and you can actually see the signal and do some more precise fine tuning um, than is allowable by the display on the 78. So that's a neat addition. And there's an earlier one as well called the MP3. 
There it is. So that would be a match for the MR71, for example. Another super cool piece that's been restored. Again, sorry for the glare. All right, so I think we've done it. We've uh, wasted at least 15, 20 minutes of your time. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, SkyFiAudio.com if you want to check out some of this hardware uh, on our website. And please uh, like and subscribe it if you enjoyed it. It'll keep us motivated. Thanks for watching.